Bibles today or your tablets today or your phones today, whatever you have your Bible on, turn over to Psalm uh, chapter 1. And we're actually going to be reading through and studying through today uh, the first five Psalms. First, I'll note over here this morning, just so that you guys can kind of keep an eye on make sure, we've got a Georgia graduate and an Alabama graduate sitting within like five feet of each other over here. So, uh, you guys, uh, you know... Uh, uh, you know, so that'll be an interesting game Saturday night, and uh, we wish you both the, the, the best of everything, uh, as long as Georgia doesn't win. It's okay. Being a Georgia Tech guy, i got to say that. I don't care if Alabama wins. I just don't want Georgia to win. But anyhow, that's, that's neither here nor there. But uh, I hope you guys had a great uh, New Year's. You know, after, the, uh, after last Sunday, after we preached on the fact that uh, uh, the upright are pleasing to God, now, Debbie and I, after service and everything, uh, we headed over to uh, South Carolina to my son's house to see some fireworks. You can't shoot fireworks in Gwinnett County, not really, not without risking, you know, them coming and getting you. But uh, so we went over to South Carolina to see some fireworks. They got better fireworks over there anyhow. And uh, uh, as we were driving along... Uh, uh, Lindsay had posted in her Facebook something about the sermon that morning and so Debbie was reading it to me and uh, it was really a really neat posting and uh, I guess the speed limit got away from me you know I, I normally drive 100% speed limit you know but uh, they're heading towards Tacoa and uh, I go that way and um, I see a, a trooper going by in the left lane over here and he's pulling over to do a U-turn and I know right then that I'm in big trouble, right? And about that time also on the right I see where another trooper has pulled over another guy and except the thing I noticed when I passed this other trooper who pulled over this other guy, uh, he was hugging the guy and I'm thinking that, that's quite odd. I don't think I've ever seen that before. So I pull on over and I get way over in the grass so the guy won't get hit by oncoming traffic or anything. And so he takes a few minutes. I'm sure he's checking me out and uh, Remember, I had just preached a sermon on how God rewards the upright, right? I just preached a sermon about that. So he comes up to the car, and uh, uh, he says, uh, are you Don? And I said, yeah, I'm Don. So, you know, I figured he got that from the license plate and everything, you know. He says, well, just take it easy going down the hill. Now, listen, it would have been a super speeder ticket if he'd gotten me, okay? I mean, I was going like 20, 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. And just not paying attention, you know, just kind of zooming down the boulevard. And he says, just take it easy going down the hill. And I looked at him, I said, thank you very much. Happy New Year. You know, so uh, God does take care of the upright. And that's what we're trying to change our minds to receive. A lot of Christians uh, have trouble receiving that. A lot of Christians uh, 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 believe in God. A lot of Christians want to go to heaven. But a lot of Christians sometimes or another doubt that God wants to reward us on this earth. Doubt that God wants to take care of us on this earth to meet our every need. So what we're doing over the next five or six uh, weeks, Weeks, and it's going to be six now because I added a sermon today that I had not planned on adding. And I'll tell you why here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, we're going to try to change our thinking so we can receive what God has for us. If you're ready to change our thinking, say amen. amen. All right, the first thing that happens when you begin to preach about all the promises in the Bible, there's thousands, literally thousands of promises that God gives us in the Bible. Now, most of those, just to be honest with you, most of those are found over in the Old Testament. Uh, the majority of them are in the Psalms and in the Proverbs and in a lot of those things in Deuteronomy uh, where God made promises to Israel. So when you start really looking at the promises of God, most of them are in the Old Testament, but not all of them. There's a lot of promises, and we just read one in Romans chapter 8 that God will work all things to our good. Who's ever claimed that promise? When something, some sort of tragedies hit your life, who's ever claimed the promise that no matter what hits your life, God will work everything out for the good? Amen. All of us have claimed that promise, and we should claim that promise. So what I want to try to say this morning is that we are new covenant saints. And what has happened is, is the Old Testament didn't disappear. Uh, my, uh, one of my grandfathers, Grandfather Cooper, was a Church of Christ debater. But he didn't have an Old Testament. All he had was a New Testament because they didn't believe in the Old Testament. Well, we're not like that. The New Testament is an extension and a completion of what was in the Old Testament. You cannot understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. So just because we're New Covenant saints, just because we're in that New Testament, New Covenant period of time because of the, of the, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, doesn't mean that the Old Testament has evaporated. So indeed, I believe that all the promises in the Bible, some are specific to Israel, 
But I believe that all the promises in the Bible, most of the promises in the Bible that are not specific to Israel, all, we can claim every single one of them. And you do what you want to do, but I intend to claim them. Amen? The overriding general premise and the overriding general promise is that when we live lives that are pleasing to God, God rewards and God blesses the upright. Now, what's the difference in being upright and being saved? All of us in this room, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, say amen. amen. Okay. That means that in the eyes of God, you've been justified. That means you've been declared by God to be righteous, and nobody can take that away from you. You've been declared by God to be righteous. You are righteous. You're never going to lose that righteousness, even if you live a stinker Christian life. Okay, just you know, let's confess it. It's the new year, so let's confess it. Who's ever lived a stinker Christian life other than me, okay? All of us have at some period of time. But even if you do that, you're not going to lose your salvation. Once we're justified, once we're born again uh, by God, we're not going to lose that salvation. But being a Christian, being born again, being justified, does not mean that our life is necessarily pleasing to God. That's where fellowship with God comes from. That's where living a life of righteousness comes from. That's where living a godly life comes from. All of that is, is very possible for the Christian, but just being a Christian doesn't guarantee that you're part of the upright or part of the righteous. So in other words, if we want to claim the promises of God, that God rewards the upright, then we have to live upright lives. And we have the ability to do that. In fact, we have more ability to do that even than David did, even than Solomon did, because we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us, helping us do that. In other words, we've got a helper. Jesus gave us a helper, a paraclete that came alongside to help us live a righteous life. Why does Jesus want to help us live a righteous life? Because he wants us to receive the benefits of, receiving, of living a righteous life. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can claim the promises of God, and we can claim that overarching promise in the Bible that God pours his favor out upon the upright. Now, the reason I selected these five psalms this morning is that <clears throat> my beginning of the year Bible study this year, I'm just reading through the Psalms, I'm reading through the Proverbs, plus some other stuff that I'm reading through as I begin the New Year Bible study, <clears throat> and I wasn't really planning on preaching on these five Psalms, but here's the reason I'm doing it. A lot of Christians, especially Baptists, and we're, we're not all Baptists in here, I understand that, but a lot of Baptists are never exposed to the idea that God blesses the upright. They claim God when they need him. They know God meets their needs. They know God can intervene in their life. But they don't, the idea that God always blesses the upright is kind of a foreign thought. So in order for us to receive that, in order for us to begin to live our lives in a different manner, see, a lot of us are basically negative people at heart. Let's just be honest. And the reason I know that a lot of us are basically negative people at, at heart is that a lot of times when things happen, we always look for the bad in every situation, or we look at where the problem is in every situation. Well, we have to change our thinking. We can't be those negative people. And when you begin to change your thinking or begin to try to change your thinking and begin to be a positive person expecting good from the world every day because God has promised to bless you, it's a hard thing to do because most of the people around you are not thinking that way. So what we're trying to do as believers in Christ and claiming his, his blessings and living upright lives and expecting the blessings of God, we're trying to do something that nobody around us is doing. And so consequently, people are going to be, begin to look at your life and A, either number one, think that you're crazy, or number two, be envious because they'd like to have that kind of life. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's what I'm trying to do in these sermons that I'm preaching over the next several weeks, is I'm trying to help me and I'm trying to help you have a change of mind so that we live victoriously. Amen? Why do we want to live and defeat when God has given us the ability to live as more than conquerors? That's what we just read in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans, uh, chapter eight. So everybody that wants to live as a conqueror instead of somebody in defeat, raise your hand and say amen. All right, then let's get on with it. Here we go, Psalms chapter 1. Every one of these five Psalms that I've selected today uh, say a lot of the same things, but, but basically what they're going to do is show you that God is intent upon blessing the man who will live righteously. So here we go, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. In other words, he's an upright man. Or stand in the way of sinners, 
for sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law he meditates day and night. So let's just stop right there. Last week we, under, we learned that one of the pillars, seven pillars of wisdom, is that we continually feed on the word of God. As we feed upon the word of God, God changes our thinking. We have the mind of Christ. We were given that when we were saved. We have the mind of Christ. We have the ability to understand what God wants out of us. We have the ability to understand God. We have all that ability. And the word of God, the word of God helps us to change, to be godly, to be righteous, to be upright. And what God wants us to be doing is delighting in him to the point that we delight in his, it says here the law, but this was before the New Testament, God wants us to delight in his word and meditate upon his word. We are what we think about. And if we think about bad things, negative things, sinful things, whatever, that's what we become. But if we think about godly things and we meditate upon the word of God, it will change our thinking. This man is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now, I don't know about you, but I claim that verse. If you claim that verse, say amen. Whatever he does, prosper. Skip over to verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So the righteous man will be blessed. Let's all say that. The righteous man will be blessed. And understanding that the righteous man is not the same as the saved man, it's the same man who's living righteously. All right, let's go to, uh, to chapter 2. Now, all of us are going to face, if you live long enough, you're going to face difficulties in your life. Every single one of us in this room. None of us are going to escape that. There's going to be challenges of all sorts. Spiritual challenges, physical challenges, financial challenges, marital challenges. No matter, if you live long enough, you're going to face family challenges. You're going to face every challenge there is to face in your lifetime. But who's in charge of those circumstances? And there's the key. Listen to this Psalm chapter 2. Listen who's in charge. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. That's Jesus. Let us break their chains, they say, and let us throw off their fetters. The one, that's Jesus, enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger. And he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possessions. You will rule over them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. In his wrath can the... In his wrath, flare up in a moment. His, his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Who is the Lord that this verse is talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Who have all of us in here taken refuge in? All of us in here who are in Christ, say amen. So we've taken refuge in Christ. So Jesus is the Lord of all. Jesus is King of kings. There is nothing that is not in the control of Jesus. Therefore, now listen. If you're listening, say amen. Therefore, every circumstance in our life is under the sovereign control of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. Does he bad, do bad things to us? No. Read the book of Job, though. God sometimes allows bad things to happen to us for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes to chasten us. We talked about that last week. And sometimes to test us. We talked about that when we studied the book of Job. But the Lord is in control. Let's all say that. The Lord is in control of everything. So therefore, since we now know that all of us are in Christ, since we know the Lord is in control, since we know that the Lord wants to bless all who are in him, all who are the righteous, he wants to bless us, we have nothing to fear. Therefore, we have confidence in every situation that the Lord is control. Look at uh, Psalms chapter 3. Now Psalms chapter 3, I was reading on Wednesday last week. And uh, we'll just listen to it, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? 
Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To to the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and I sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. He will not, I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break all the teeth of the wicked, for the Lord comes deliverance. And so I label this psalm, God delivers the upright. Let's all say that. God delivers the upright. I have two sons that are in business with me. My oldest son has been in business with me now about 18 years. And so <clears throat> our pattern is, is uh, once or twice a day, I do certain things, he does certain things. And once or twice a day, we talk and make sure we're all heading in the same direction and we're not duplicating efforts. And so I call, called him Wednesday morning, and I couldn't get him on the phone, so I figured, well, maybe he's down at the shop, can't his cell phone not working, so I called him down the shop, he wasn't at the shop. And... Uh, the guy at the shop said, well, I think we, we think he's having a heart attack. Well, I hadn't heard that. I'm his dad. So I called back to his house, and he finally answers his cell phone. I said, what's wrong? He says, well, I couldn't sleep all night. I'm having chest pains. I said, well, we, you got to get to the hospital, man. He said, I'm going to the hospital. I'll get it checked out. I just finished my Bible study that morning. The Lord delivers the upright. And all day long, I claim that. All day long. And see... That's another good reason for you to feed on the Word of God every single day. Because you never know when you're going to have to have it in order to overcome the day. It'd be easy to wring my hands and it'd been easy to worry about this and that and the other. It'd been easy just to to fall out and, you know, uh, because here I got a 41-year-old son who thinks he's having a heart attack. And stranger things have happened in the world. But I, I never really, it never got hold of me because all day long, every time I felt a little fear rising up, every time I felt a little worry rising up, I proclaimed to myself, the Lord delivers the upright. And my son is upright. He lives a righteous life. The Lord delivers the upright. Let's all say that. The Lord delivers the upright. And he did. As it turned out, there was nothing wrong with my son's heart. He'd had pneumonia uh, back in November, and it had created a tear in his lungs, literally a punctured lung from the inside out, and that was causing the pain, and it caused intense pain, but it wasn't a heart attack. Amen? A, pun- a little punctured lung is one thing. A heart attack is a whole different ballgame. No cardiac problems, just a punctured lung. Uh, the Lord is good. The Lord took care of him. Amen? The Lord delivers the upright. You can believe that. Claim that yourself if you want to. Use that in these situations. I intend to do that. I hope that you do the same thing because in this new year, we're trying to change our thinking. We're trying to tap into the blessings that the Lord wants to give us, but we have to receive those blessings. Where are we? Psalm 4. Now watch this. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. And I think I'll read this entire chapter and then we'll come back and talk about it because it flows. Answer me, answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How many times have you begged God to hear your prayer? Amen. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Everybody in this room that is a saint, say, every believer in Jesus Christ is a saint. We've been set apart for God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord will hear when I call to him. That's a promise. You could write a little P next to it. You can put an air next to it. The Lord will hear when I call to him. That is a promise we can claim. In your anger, do not sin. You know why we get mad? One of my greatest failings in my life is I have a short fuse. But you know why we get mad in life? We get mad in life a lot of times because we're fearful. Uh, We get mad in life sometimes because we're worried. We get mad in life sometimes because we're negative. And the Lord says, uh, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, don't let anger, don't let fear, don't let worry, don't let distress take over. Uh, we are, when you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. You're going to encounter things in your life that are overwhelming. 
I have encountered those things. You will encounter those things. At some point or another, your friends will encounter those things, your family members. And all you can do in those situations is trust God. If, 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 if I come to visit you and you're in a bad situation and there's no explanation of why you're in that bad situation, I'm just going to tell you, trust God. Because that's what the Lord wants us to do. No fear, no anger, trust God. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when there was grain and new wine abounding. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. How many times have you had those problems that kept you awake all night? See, the Lord says that when we trust in him, when we take claim the promise that he hears our prayer, that where there could be great sorrow, where there can be great distress, where there can be great worry, in place of that, he gives us great joy. And beyond that, he gives us peace so that we can lie down and sleep expecting God to do something great. Now think about that. A lot of times we lay awake and we toss and turn and we worry about this and we worry about that and we worry about this. But the Lord says that when you give me your petition, give me your prayer, you can have that confidence knowing that I hear your prayer and that I will answer you. And in place of your fear and your worry, I will give you joy and I'll make it possible for you to lie down and to sleep in peace. Been many a night that I wish I had claimed that where I could sleep in peace instead of tossing and turning. Amen. The Lord does not want us to toss and turn in fear and in worry. No way. That is not God's will. God wants us to trust in him and receive his joy and receive his peace. Hope you claim it. I claim that. Now, Psalm chapter 5. I kind of entitled this psalm, psalm, God surrounds the upright with his favor. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sign. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you, and I wait expectantly. When you pray to the Lord, do you wait expecting God to respond? Do you wait expecting God to take care of the situation? See, God wants us waiting expectantly upon him. It it, it, we can't say that we, we claim these things and instead of waiting expectantly for God to respond, we wait expectantly for the, for the rest of the bottom to drop out. We have to wait expectantly for God to intervene. And he will intervene. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord of horrors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house in reverence while I bow down. You see, the Lord has blessed all of us. If you've been blessed by the Lord at some point in your life, say amen. When we come into this house on Sunday, we come into this house to receive a word from the Lord. Yes, that's right. But we also come into this house to worship him. And worshiping is bowing down and acknowledging who he is. See, worship is not lifting your hands and praising. That's praise, praising. Worship is bowing down and acknowledging that God's in charge of our lives. Is God in charge of your life? See, if God's in charge of your life, then he calls the shots. But to be honest with you, I've learned the hard way. I'd rather him be calling the shots than me calling the shots. When I call them shots, I make a lot of mistakes. When he calls the shots, it's never a mistake. And so the Lord wants us to let him, listen, he even says it. He says, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness uh, because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. And I wrote in here, God's way, not my way. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction. Their throat is an open grave. This is when you get advice from your friends. Sometimes you get in trouble. You go in and ask advice from your friends. If you would be as diligent to ask advice from God as you are to ask advice from your friends. I remember in a marriage counseling session, uh, in the session, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the woman or the wife to be in the session says, I just feel like that I'm making a mistake. I said, why do you feel like you're making a mistake? She said, well, I've been talking to all my girlfriends. And right there, my little antenna went up 
uh, because girls, I, you know, you can get in a lot of trouble talking to your girlfriends because you never know what kind of experience they've had. And so the thing to do, is spend all, instead of spending all that time talking to your girlfriends or your, or, your, or your male friends or whatever, spend that time talking to God and allow him to direct your steps. Look at verse 11. But let all who take refuge, you, refuge in you, O Lord, be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. If you claim that, say amen. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. So it's like I said last week. The righteous of the Lord, we're surrounded not only by the Holy Spirit. In the spiritual realm, you can see the Holy Spirit surrounding us. But not only that, but we're surrounded by the favor of the Lord. Yet we live in grace. But that grace also translates into favor. So in other words, even though we're all going to face challenges, we face those challenges when we're living upright lives. We face those challenges in the favor of the Lord. Are you going to have bad things happen to you? You betcha. That's just living in this world. This world is filled with sin, and there's going to be bad things happen to you, and Jesus is going to let some of those things come into your life. But we want to be equipped to face those things. We don't have to be defeated by those things. We can learn to live in victory at those things. These Psalms are written by David, who was being hunted by Saul and Saul's armies in an effort to kill him. He was living in caves. He was living by himself. He was living without food and water sometimes. People were hunting him. Every place he went in Israel, they were after him. Saul was after him. And yet he proclaimed that he trusted in the Lord. And he could lay down and sleep, even, even in a cave where people were, uh, were hunting him, trying to kill him, because the Lord had given his heart peace. The Lord wants to take care of and bless the upright. Last week we learned that the upright are pleasing to God. So the first question you ask this morning is, number one, are you saved? You've got to be saved because you can't be, you can't be lost and separated from God by your sin and be pleasing to God at the same time, that can't happen. So the first thing that happens, you have to be saved, which means you have to be connected to God. The second question is, if you are saved, and I suspect most of the people in this room are saved, the second question is, if you are saved, are you living a life that is pleasing to God? You cannot expect the blessings of God if you're not living a life that's pleasing to God. So this morning, what do you need to do? We need to go out of here this morning with a new mind. We need to go out of here this morning trusting God. We need to go out of this morning claiming the fact that God rewards the upright. And we need to go out this morning dedicating ourselves and disciplining ourselves to live upright, righteous lives before the Lord. If you're willing to do that this morning, say amen. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your good word. I thank you for your promises, Lord. I thank you for your encouragement from your word. I thank you, Lord, the way you intervene in our life. I thank you, Lord, that where you give us joy in the place of worry. I thank you, Lord, where you give us faith in the place of fear. I thank you, Lord, where you give us peace uh, in, the, in the place of agitation. Lord, I just praise your name this morning because you've promised to us, Lord, in your word, to give us lives that are beyond imagination and beyond anything that the world can imagine. So Lord, I pray today that you would change all of us so that all of us here could claim your promises, live in your promises, live, in, live, in, live, live victorious Christian lives in you. This is our prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise your holy name and everybody said... Amen. Uh, let's stand up and let's sing an invitation song. And if you need to do anything, that's fine. This is your time in the service. Uh, sing the invitation. Speak to God. Let God encourage you. Go out of here expectant for the week that is to come, expecting good things to happen to you. Will you have some challenges? You betcha. But God what? Romans chapter 8, verse 28, first verse we read. God works all things together for your good. If you claim that this morning, say amen. Let's sing to the Lord.